Well, that was a true story, by the way. That actually happened. And as I was preparing, I, I thought that was a good setup because of what we're going to discuss this evening. Because giving and compassion. This whole week we've been talking about our theme of being consumed with Christ. In the mornings we've discussed putting things aside, counting them as lost so that we may move forward. And we've discussed pressing on that we may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of us. I hope you've been thinking about that. What has Jesus laid hold of you for? And as I was preparing for this evening, I was thinking about this. I mean, it's been a long week. And I asked God, I said, I mean, I kind of knew the outline of where we were going, but I said, how, how should this be approached? Because especially after a night like yesterday, with so many things shared, you know, what exactly needs to be discussed tonight? And God kind of gave me a, a thought. He says, this is how you approach it. He says, approach it as if this is the last message somebody in this room will ever hear. I wonder if that is the case. And if it was the last message that you would ever hear, what would it be that God would want you to know? You ever have thought about that? Now you might sit here and say, oh, well, that, it's not going to be the last message I ever hear. Some of you will be in church on Sunday, or at least that's the plan, so you'll hear another message there. But you know, in James, it tells us to boast not for tomorrow. For we don't know what tomorrow brings. It says, what is your life? It is like a vapor which appears for a while, for a moment really, and then passes away. And it says that people make all kinds of plans. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there. And yet James reminds us, he says, what you should be asking and what you should be saying is if the Lord wills, I will do this or I will do that. And we've discussed this week, what is the Lord's will for you? How does he want you to live? Where does he want you to go? What does he want you to do with your life? And tonight, we're going to talk about being consumed with the Lord's compassion. Consumed with the Lord's compassion. Now, what is compassion? It is a sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. Let me use simpler terms. You can see that somebody's hurting, and it bothers you, and you feel for them, and you want to help. And you want to make it better, if you possibly can. Just this afternoon, I was reading a, a little story that got put on Facebook. Kind of an interesting thought. And it was this. If a giraffe drank coffee, do you know that the coffee would be cold by the time it got down its neck and to its stomach? And then there was a question there that said, have you ever thought about that? And then it said, of course not, because you're only worried about yourself. And I know for many years, that was me. That I was worried about what was going on with me. I was worried about the, the things I was trying to accomplish. I was worried about anything that affected me. I grew up that way. No church background, no nothing. My mom and dad were great parents. But my mom basically taught me, you take care of you and yours. And you can't be worried about other people. And you can't be worried about what's going on with them. And, and you certainly aren't going to go out of your way and use your own resources or jeopardize your own family to try to help somebody else out. Now, God changed her heart later on in life when he came into her life. But that's the way that I was brought up. And that's the way many of us live. What is going on with me? Last night was really interesting. It reminded me of a time 
when I was 17 and it was Christmas, I had been saved less than a year, and we went over to our youth, youth leader's house. I remember it well. He had this humongous Christmas tree because he had a very large ceiling in his back room. It was very large, and we all sat around couches and and um, and people started to open up. It was it was a high school youth group, and they started to open up about some of the things that were going on in their life, and it got very tearful and it got very emotional. And I was thinking as I was sitting there going, man, why don't we as teens do this more often? I mean, we go to school and we pretend everything's okay. We go to church and we pretend everything's okay. We put on a front. We, we put all, all our, our defenses that we put up and we don't let anybody in. And nobody knows that anything's wrong. And, and we do that all the time. And, and I wished on that night that we would learn to do that all the time. Now, let me tell you the next time that I saw that happen. Last night. That's been 31 years. It just doesn't happen very often. And I do believe that that's one of the biggest problems that we have today as Christians. That we have lost the ability to be compassionate We have lost the ability to feel things as Christ feels them. We have lost the ability to be there for each other. My question to you tonight is, is there anyone in this room that wants to change that? I hope the answer to that is yes. Let's look at Mark chapter 6, verse 30 to 44. Mark chapter 6. Go ahead and turn so you can follow along. Hopefully you brought your Bible in. If not, you can follow on the screen, but it's always, nice, it's always good to take notes there. And I've broken it down. Hopefully you can read this, but in some areas of the room, it'd be very hard for you to read it. Mark 6, verses 30 to 44. It was an interesting time for the apostles. It's an interesting time for the intimate followers of Jesus. They had just been sent out. They had went and done some pretty neat things. And so they came back and they wanted to tell the Lord about it. And they were all about what they had just done. There was one problem though. And that was the inconvenience of other people being around. Who here has ever thought of other people sometimes in your life as an inconvenience or just they're there when you want your own attention and they're there when you want to do your own thing? And that's what kind of happened here. He came back and even Jesus himself, he says in verse 31, says he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they had had this exciting day. There's people all around. Jesus says, hey, you haven't even had time to eat yet. Let's go to a deserted place, and let's rest, and let's talk, and and let's just kind of bask in the moment. Okay, there's only one problem. And this is a problem that a lot of people have in their lives today. It's like, man, life would be great if it just wasn't for other people. I've heard people in church say that. Us pastors have said that many times. Church, being a pastor and and being in church would be awesome if it just wasn't for the people. That sounds weird, doesn't it? And shame on us for even thinking that. But sometimes it's true. And it says here that when they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves, verse 33, those nosy, needy multitudes of people, and we're talking thousands here, saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together. So they get in the boat to leave so they can get some privacy. They get in the boat so they can get some solitude. They get in the boat so they can be left alone. And the people like hightailed it around while they're in the boat. And when they get to shore, the same people are there waiting for them. Man, that didn't work. 
And it says that when Jesus, when he came out and he saw the great multitude, he was moved with compassion for them. Because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. You know what we do often in our life? We spend a lot of time thinking about what other people think. Isn't that true? Do you know that much of the actions that you take in your life are all based on other people's opinion? For instance, the music groups you like or don't like is often based on whether your friends like them or whether they don't like them. The clothes you wear. You think to yourself, how do I look? What will people think of me when they see me in this? The way you do your hair. I don't worry about that too much anymore. But, but you know, the hairstyle, the, the, the way, ladies, the way you do your makeup. And you notice that people tend to do their makeup the same way. You'll be in a group where there's hardly any at all. Or some like really, you know, bright colors and, and all of that. And then a lot of people will have that. That's fine. You are so controlled by what other people think and you worry about it. I wonder if you've ever asked this question. What does God think of me? The God who the Bible says has been there every moment of your life. In Psalm 139, it says that you cannot get up or sit down without him noticing. You can't think a single thought without him knowing it. No matter where you go, on the earth or anywhere, you could not be where he's not. That's how big this God is. He's everywhere and he's all-powerful and he's all-knowing. And he's able to do anything. And a God that is as powerful as this, have you ever thought, man, what does that God think about me? And my problems, and my circumstances, and my household, and my school life, and the things that I think about at night when I'm laying in bed and nobody else knows. It says that when Jesus, I, I don't know what you think he thinks about you, but when he saw these multitude here, thousands of people, he was moved with compassion. Now, the ones with him were not that way. We'll find that out in a minute. They're like, man, are you serious? We just left to get away from them. But he was moved. You know, that's the kind of Savior that you have. You don't have a Savior who is not sympathetic to what you're going through. You don't have a Savior that doesn't understand. You don't have a Savior that says, ah, suck it up, wipe your nose, and quit complaining about everything. You have a Savior who's moved with compassion. This is why he said they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. Now, who in here knows anything about sheep? Right, you know a little bit about sheep. Aren't there sheep here? I haven't gone down to the barn this week, but aren't there some sheep here? They're up on the hill? I don't know how much you know about sheep, but let's just say if you were compared to sheep, it's not really the biggest compliment in the world. Sheep are nice. We like sheep. We love sheep. But when it says here that these people were like sheep without a shepherd, let me tell you what happens to sheep without a shepherd. They get hurt. They get lost. They get sick. They fall off cliffs. They die. Sheep don't do well without a shepherd. They really don't. They wander aimlessly. And they make all kinds of crucial, critical mistakes. It's not healthy to be a sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus saw this multitude of people. And that's how he looks at us. And he may be looking in this room tonight and still saying, there are some in here that are like sheep without a shepherd. 
oh, they're hearing about the shepherd. They know kind of about the shepherd. They can tell others somewhat about the shepherd, but they still don't know the shepherd. They still don't hear his voice. And he's moved with compassion. When he hears the testimonies of your pain, that moves the heart of God. He's been there. He knows that. And by the way, he didn't cause your pain. Because God, unfortunately, so often gets blamed for it. I have these conversations with grown adults all the time that have gone through some of the things that you're going through and now they're older and they never got this right in their mind and it's just going further and they blame God. Do you know we live in a fallen world that is damaged by sin? It's a world where the devil is active. His demons are active. They're hateful. They don't like you. In fact, to say that is an understatement. They hate you, and if God would let them, they'd kill you. But God restrains them from doing that. And people often say, why does God not do anything? Why does God sit back and wait? Doesn't God care? You're saying that God is a compassionate God, and yet He continues to allow evil in the world. He continues to allow people to do things. I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says that God is not slack concerning his promise of coming back, but he's waiting and he is suffering through it, just like we are, because he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. It is possible, it is very possible that Jesus has not come back yet because he's waiting for you. I'm thankful that back in 1984 or whatever year that was, I'm thankful that Jesus hadn't come back yet. I'm thankful that Jesus hadn't come back the day before I went to church that day and God reached into my life and grabbed hold of me. I'm thankful that He suffered all this evil in the world that He has to look at and that burns Him and that He hates every day because he cared enough about me that he suffered through it just like everyone else so that I could be saved. How about you? Jesus is so compassionate and he saw the people and it moved his heart. And today it's the same thing. He sees the ones that have been hurt, the ones that have been abused, the ones that have been deserted, The ones that have been damaged. The ones that have been told ugly things that they'll never forget. He sees the hurt of those who feel so bad about themselves that they can barely look at themselves in a mirror because of things that have happened in their life. He sees it. And it hurts him. Just like it hurts you. And his heart goes out. And he is moved with compassion. So he began, it says, to teach them many things. Just like God has allowed you to learn this week. Not just in here. In your cabin devotions in the morning. With your counselors at night. All the influences that you have had. All the people that have been a part of your life this week. God has given you this opportunity to be taught many things. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. But notice the reaction of his disciples. Some of you didn't sound too excited when I just said, isn't that awesome? You know what? They weren't either. His disciples came. And they said, this is a deserted place and already the hour is late. Send them away. That they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Translated, here we go, this is my modern paraphrase translation, not inspired, but 
Let me just tell you what this means. I can't believe these people are still here. This has been such a long day. We're hungry, and we don't have food for them. We want to eat. Send them some, go send them home so they can eat somewhere else so that we can eat. That's what they were saying. Now, let me ask you. Jesus there is moved with compassion, and he's teaching them many things. The rest of them, do they have any of those same type of feelings whatsoever? No. No. I asked this earlier this week, but I'll phrase the same question. If you were there with Jesus, and you were in the same situation, what would you be thinking? I know for much of my life I would be thinking, ah, just let him go. When's dinner? Growing up, when I first went to church, back in the days, evening service, they'd have missionaries come in to the evening service. They'd always show up at the evening service. Back then we didn't have computer shows, so they had slideshows. And these slides were in cartridges used by a slide projector. Now, when I see those types of shows today, I get excited. I, I look at that going, wow, look at what God's doing. That's pretty neat in that country where they didn't have God's word, and, and then this is happening, and that's great commitment. Look at those lives change. That's the way I think now. It's not the way I thought then. I'd be like, missionary, slideshow, oh, are you kidding? Oh, that's so boring. Seeing a bunch of pictures, they all look the same. You see one starving kid, you've seen them all, they're all the same, they all look, the, you know, that, that's the way that I was. And then they'd have those, those carousels with all the little slides in there, and they'd finally get all the way around, and then a blank one would come up, and you're like, yes! They're done! Praise God! And then they'd take it off and put on the next one. And be like, oh kidding me? There's just no compassion. None. I only cared about me. Maybe you're here and you only care about you. But I don't believe that. Because I saw compassion. It's in there. Now it may not be there every day. But I saw it. Didn't you see it? Anyone else see it besides me? Raise your hand if you saw something, some glimpse of compassion. That's the quality of God right there. And he doesn't want you to have to wait 31 years to see it again or to feel it again. In fact, just imagine if that took place in your life every week, multiple times per week, Imagine if that took place in your churches. Imagine if that took place in your homes. Imagine if that took place in your schools. Imagine if that was a characteristic of your life all the time. Would anybody's life be changed in some way? What do you think? Yes or no? Yes. yes. So notice what Jesus says to the response. See, these disciples, they did what we so often do. And they got self-absorbed. And they just weren't feeling it. And they're like, Pastor, sit down. Come on, you've already been up there for 30 minutes. But you know what Jesus said? He answered them and He said, You give them something to eat. Don't miss that. Because when you're looking at this story, and you're going, where's the compassion? And isn't it awesome that God feels that way? And how is it that people are going to feel God's compassion and know God's compassion? You know what Jesus is saying tonight? You do it. Don't be looking to God to do everything. He uses you to do it. He gives you the privilege of doing it. You think it's because He can't do it? He doesn't need you. He gives you the privilege of doing it. Your life will be changed by it. Your life will be blessed by it. He could do it himself, but he gives you the privilege of doing it. 
It's a privilege to serve God. It's a privilege to bless others. It's a privilege to be used by Him to change lives. We don't change the lives, but it's a privilege that God would say, I'll let you be there. I'll let you be a part of it. I'll let you witness it. I'll let you do something through your life that actually matters, that actually lasts, that when you get to heaven, you'll actually see people there that were touched because I used you. Because all this other stuff you're going to get caught up in, that's just going to wither away. What you bought at the mall last week, you're not taking that with you. They don't wear that stuff up there in heaven. Totally different style. I don't know what the style is, but that stuff doesn't go. Those things, that drama in your life that you're so concerned about, and you're on the phone for hours, internet for hours, chatting for hours, all that kind of stuff, guess what? Nobody's going to care about that in heaven. I know it's big to you right now, but it's not going to matter. What he said or she said or what they're thinking, oh, do they like me? Do they not like me? Oh, what are they thinking? It does, it's not going to matter. But man, if I change your life, and you're encouraged, and then you also change the lives of others, and we all get to heaven together, that lasts forever. And your life will be more than just a tombstone with two dates and a dash in between. But notice the excuses. You know they actually got mad and irritated, kind of like I am with this fly up here. I call him Lucifer. And, and he's the Lord of the flies because more came. So, so they said to him, they, they, they actually talked back to Jesus with attitude. Check it out. They said, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? That was like over six months wages right there. They looked at Jesus as like, you want us to go buy? You want us to go spend all that money so we can feed all those people? Can you imagine who they're talking to and they said this? Guess what? You and I do it all the time. God says, I want you to go here. Oh, well, I can't go there. Are you kidding? Why should I go help so-and-so? They don't care about me. You want me to give my life to this? What? I'm not going to do that. We talk back to God all the time. We argue with him. All the time. Oh, maybe you're not doing it here. Because of course you're not going to do it here. After all, you're getting Bible like three times a day. All the other junk you watch and listen to all the other rest of your life is not being filtered in. So it's like God's got your attention. And everybody's pretty much thinking the same thing. But go home and stand alone. That's different. And we know that from experience, right? So are we going to allow God to grab hold of us? Or are we going to give Him this kind of attitude? Some of you have already done it. You have already told God that when you go home, within three days, you'll be back to normal. You've already decided that in your head. Because it's happened before. You already have believed that God is not strong enough and God is not capable enough of actually changing your life for the long haul. And you've already told him that. You've already agreed to that. You've already accepted that. Is your God that small? What did he say to them? How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. They sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. When he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, gave them to his disciples to set before them, and the two fish he divided among them all. They all ate, were filled. They took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Sorry, ladies, they didn't count you. Sorry, children, they didn't count you. There was probably more like 15 to 20,000. 
15 to 20,000. Now, where in that passage, where in that passage do you see the disciples going and buying the bread? You don't. Where do you see them going and buying the fish? You don't. They didn't go fishing, even though a lot of them fished. They didn't go to the market. They didn't gather the bread. You see, we make up all these excuses saying, oh, I couldn't possibly do this, and God's asking me too much, and God's asking me all. No. God's asking you to take what you have. You. And give it. That's all he's asking. He does the rest. Some of you think you have a lot to give. Some of you think you have very little. God's just saying, will you just give it? Just give it as I am directing you to give it. I'll multiply it. I'll fill people with it. It's not your job. It's not your responsibility to do that. I just want you to give what I've given you. Your life. Your heart. The resources that I've put before you. Nothing more. Just what you have. God does not begin by asking our ability. But more of our availability. When we prove our dependability, he will increase our capability. I remember the first day I was a youth pastor at Santa Clarita Baptist Church way back in 1986, December 1st, 1986. And I sat down in my office. I was shown my office. My office was real awesome. It was one <laughs> tiny room with a desk and a phone. We didn't have cell phones. So there was an actual phone on the desk. The administrator, the administrative assistant, the pastor's secretary, she, she let me in there. And she said, well, here you go. Enjoy. I said, thank you. And she left and the door shut behind. And then I immediately started out on all the planning that I was going to be doing and all the stuff I was going to be doing in the next few minutes. And yeah, after about three minutes, I was done. I searched the cabinets to see if there was anything interesting to look at. I looked in the drawers. I sat there for about an hour. And I said to God, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. None. And God said, I just want you to be willing. That's it. So after about an hour, I went into the office and I said to, um, you know, I had to swallow my pride. I said to the secretary, I said, is the pastor in? And she said, yeah. And I go, can I see him for a second? So I go in, I sit down and he goes, hey, what's up? How's it going? You like your office? I go, oh yeah, it's, it's great. Um, this is going to sound like a really stupid question and I'm really kind of embarrassed to even ask this but what is it that I'm supposed to be doing I mean I understand I'm supposed to teach like Sunday school and youth group but except for that I, I don't even know what to do and so he told me a little bit of what to do but you know what God then helped me figure it out he just took my willingness and availability some of you wondered how you were going to get to camp and whether you should go to camp or not, and yet God somehow provided it. Some of you, God may call to take like short-term mission trips or long-term mission trips or different things like this, and you go, well, I couldn't do that. I, I don't know what to do, and I certainly don't have the money for it. God does, God, that's God's department. You be willing. Maybe there's ministry needs at your church. Maybe there's like Sunday school classes or, or groups or in kids' programs kids younger than you, and you go, oh, I've never worked in a program before. I wouldn't know how to do that. Just be willing. Just be willing. And God will use you. And be compassionate. And allow yourself to feel something for somebody else. Last passage we're going to look at tonight. It says... 
when it comes to being a follower of Jesus Christ, if, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, I hope that's you, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, why would you do that? As God calls you tonight, to, uh, this is what I'm, what I'm being led by God to call you to do. I'm calling for people to actually make a commitment. Yeah, you know that word that people don't like to use today? A commitment. When you make a commitment, that means you're committing to do something. God's looking for people, I believe, in this room to make a commitment that they don't know how, they don't know where, they don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of how it's going to work. But make a commitment to say, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to give my life to serve you, to bless others, to be your light in a world of darkness, to be the salt of the earth, all the things that we've talked about. I want this to consume me because that verse that we've been discussing all week, there's something that you've laid hold of my life for and I am consumed and obsessed with finding out what it is and actually accomplishing it and doing it. Now some of you hear this and after a whole week, you're like, yeah, yeah, that's good, okay, but yeah, I still have my other stuff I want to do. I'm not going to do that. You're talking way too religious fanatical for me. I'm not going to be jumping all in like that. I have my own life. I have my own things. I have my stuff that I got to take care of. That stuff, if it fits in, that's fine. Well, let, look at what Jesus says. It says, whoever desires to save their life, in other words, make sure you do the things in life that you want to do. We'll lose it. They'll lose it. Years will go by. Memories will pile up. And before you know it, you'll be old. You will be. And you will think to yourself, the same thing I thought last night. I even posted it on my Facebook page. And I've, you know, done a lot of things. I've, God's allowed me to do a lot of ministry. But this is what he impressed upon my heart while I sat right there on the stage. I thought, wow, I have wasted so much time. Don't think you won't be there. He says, yeah, and before you know it, while you're trying to save your life, while you're trying to not do everything that he's calling you to do, before you know it, you'll have lost it. It'll just be evaporating before your eyes. And before you know it, you'll be going to doctors and they'll be telling you about how you're fat. My doctor's polite. She says, I'm stage one obese. So I tell her, I said, okay, doc, thanks, but you're saying I'm fat. And she goes, well, I, I didn't want to be rude. And then they'll be telling you things like you're pre-diabetic, so cut down your sugar. Then they'll be wanting to give you blood pressure medication, which you fight. I'm still fighting that one. I try to lose some weight first. And before you know it, all this stuff starts piling up and you look back at camp pictures like this week and you go, wow. It seems like just yesterday there I was sitting in chapel hearing about this. Where did the time go? You know, in two weeks I'm not going because I don't have time. In two weeks is my 30-year high school graduation, uh, reunion. 30 years. And it's sad because you go back to these things and, and the only thing you can really, some people can be excited about is that they look at someone else and go, wow, they have more hair on their head than, you know, or, or less than I do. You know, that's about it. I mean, there's some people, you know what's sad? When I went to my 10-year reunion, some people still look like they hadn't left high school. They hadn't done anything. 20 years, they start to look like adults. In 30 years, you got people full of regrets. Their life is just evaporating. You'll be there before you know it. He says, the one who tries to save his life will lose it. But check this out. The one who loses their life for my sake will find it. 
For what profit is it to a man if he were to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. There's going to be a time when we stand before the Lord and we want to hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He doesn't need you to be the most intelligent. He doesn't need you to be the most athletic. He doesn't need you to be the, the most engineering, the most mechanical. All he needs you to do is be the most willing and compassionate and to feel his love around you. Now, in the beginning of the week, on the first night, I shared with you something. I said that many years ago, when called into ministry, God really grabbed hold of my heart. There was a recording that I heard. And I heard that recording of a young man who was at the end of his rope and who took his life. And I remember that recording and it's something that I made a promise. You see, when you make a promise to give yourself into ministry, it's not usually because that's the most convenient thing to you. It's because God fills your heart with compassion. I also told you that while I watched you in res registration, I was asking God as you were walking through, and I had no idea, and most of you I never met before. I was asking God, who is it in here? <coughs> who is it here that's hurting? Who is it here that's gone through stuff? Who is it here that's really struggling right now? Which two or three is it? Which four or five is it? It's a lot more than that, isn't it? And I had no idea. And sometimes we got to be moved to compassion. You know, for years, for years I could only remember that recording. When I first went to El Monte, I had it. I had a tape, and I played it. And then I looked for it a couple of years later, and I could not find it. It was lost. I contacted the guy who was the speaker in the chapel that I was in. I asked him if he had it, because I really wanted it. He didn't have it. In fact, he, interestingly enough, he barely even remembered doing the message. So I searched. I searched the internet. I searched different things. I had pretty much given up. About a year and a half ago, God let me find it. So I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to take a risk because somebody in here possibly needs to hear what I heard. And I just encourage you to close your eyes, whatever. There's nothing blatant on it. There's nothing horrible or you know, anything like that. Some of you will relate. Some of you won't relate, but you'll feel compassion and maybe God will move you. After this is over... We'll actually maybe dim some of the center lights and we have the worship team come up here. We'll do a little bit of an invitation and then we'll do a song that you can just kind of take in while we do it. So please listen carefully as I cue this up for you.
Bow our heads and close our eyes. Let me ask you. What has God been trying to tell you this week? Why have you gone through some of the things that you have? Isn't it a miracle that God could come into your life and change it and be there. Isn't it a miracle that maybe you're here tonight and you have felt as if you've been looking for love all your life and it's not there. And yet it tells us that Jesus is your compassionate Lord, your compassionate Savior. You know, I don't believe in coincidences and I don't believe that you're here by an accident. Of all the campgrounds you could be at, of all the weeks you could be, of all the cities you could live in, the God who made you knew before you were even born that you'd be here tonight. And this week, and he's reaching out, there's different people that are in this room. There's those who have heard the message of God's love and compassion and how He feels about you all week long and have yet to respond. The day that Jesus came into my life, I was afraid that I didn't have a tomorrow. I was afraid that I might never feel God's presence the way I did that day if I walked away. So as we sing this song in a few minutes, if you're here and you still need Jesus Christ, your counselors will be watching. You can raise your hand. Or you can go to them. And He'll change your life forever. You might be here tonight 
and you're dealing with some things and some of the stuff we've discussed even this evening have stirred up some emotions. You know, when I just played that recording for you, I, I want you to understand why. That, what that young man did is something that God would never want anybody to do. So it definitely was not for the purpose of glorifying or anything like that because that is something God would never want anyone to do. He has made you special. But I'll tell you what I thought when I heard that. God impressed upon my heart and said, I wonder what would have happened if there was one person, I don't know whether there was or not, but if there was one person that would have been there to reach out to him. I wonder if it would have been a different ending. I wonder if that's all he needed. And God told me that day, he said one day, and probably more than once, there's going to be another 16-year-old boy or another 16-year-old girl. There's going to be somebody out there who's going through the same thing. I want you to be there. It's very possible that you've gone through some of the stuff you have because God wants, He's calling you. He wants you to be there. You could literally be used by Him to change a life, a family, a destiny, an eternity. God wants to give you that privilege. What could be a higher calling in life than being used by God for that? So in a moment, we're just going to just keep your eyes closed. I'm going to sing with the praise band. And we're going to sing a song called Overwhelmed. And just listen to the words. And if you're overwhelmed by God's love this week, by what Christ has done for you, He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to have you come. He paid for them on the cross. He wants you to know Him. You raise your hand. Or if you are making a commitment, and remember, we said last night, don't disrespect the coach. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. If you make a promise, do not just make a promise to stand up. If you make a promise before God tonight to give Him your life, understand that you need to have every intention of keeping that promise. Because he wants to hold you to what you say. So we're not asking for fake decisions or everybody just raise your hand because somebody else does or everybody stand up because somebody else does. But if God's really grabbed you and you're really willing, then we encourage you to just stand where you are when that time comes as we sing this song, as you listen to these words. I see the work of your hands Galaxies spinning a heavenly dance Oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming And I hear the sound of your voice all at once it's a gentle and thundering noise, oh God, all that you are, so overwhelming. I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty, I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed. God, I run into your arms Unashamed because of mercy I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed by you If you're here tonight and you would say 
Lord, I will give you my life. Lord, I will serve you. Stand right where you are. If you're here tonight and you need the Lord in your life and you need your counselor or someone, raise your hand right where you are. That's what he's saying. I know the power of your cross. Forgiven and free. Forever you'll be my God. And all that you've done is so overwhelming. I delight myself in you. In the glory of your presence. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. And God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God's calling you to move, then move. You are beautiful, you are beautiful. Oh God, there is no one more beautiful. You are beautiful, God, you are the most beautiful. Is there anyone more beautiful? You are wonderful, you are wonderful. Oh God, there is no one more wonderful. You are wonderful. God, you are the most wonderful. Sing it out if you know the song. Words are up here. You are glorious. You are glorious. Oh God, there is no one more glorious. You are glorious. Lord, you are glorious and I delight myself in you captivated by your beauty I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed by you God I run into your arms yourself to be overwhelmed by God. In just a few moments, we'll be going out to the fire circle as well, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. And you know the invitation is not closed. God is calling some of you to give him your life. God is calling some of you to not leave without knowing him. And you're holding back and you're not allowing him to overwhelm you. There's one, one in existence that you can let go. Because he's the one that can be trusted. And that is your creator and your Lord. So we'd encourage you as we go out there, let's pray together. Father, we pray for all these awesome young people that are in this room these special creations. We pray that many would run into your arms. We pray, Father, that we will seek and allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by you. Father, may it be our desire that your power would run through us. May it be our desire that as we go home, Although you have always been with us, this time we take you with. Father, there are some here that you want them to say, Lord, I don't know how, I don't know when, 
but I'm willing. You show me and I will go. You give me the opportunity and I will do it. Father, help me to feel compassion. The compassion that your son Jesus had for me, help me to feel that for my friends, for those in my church, for those in my school, for my brothers, for my sisters, for my neighbors. Father, may you fill my heart and take my life. And Father, we just pray these things that you'll bless greatly and you'll be honored and you'll be glorified and that lives will be changed. And we pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Camp Dad.